like, Grant, can I share a quick story with you? He's like, absolutely. So I shared this Kilimanjaro story with him. It's like, oh man, that's so cool. So he goes up on stage in front of three or 4,000 people. It's like, I met someone interesting backstage. Where's Kyle? Come up here. I was like, oh shit. During COVID, try and imagine renovating and flipping properties with Home Depot clothes. We couldn't get the trades. They didn't mm -hmm. want to work. So who ended up doing the work? My business partner and I. There was a point where I think I bought my fourth or fifth townhouse off the developers and they cut, one of them just stopped and said, how are you doing this? Across from me today is a real estate tycoon with 15 years in the world of real estate investing. He has shared the stage with people like Grant Cardone, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kyle Guthrow, thank you for coming. The one morning meeting huddle, Grant had mentioned, how the hell are these Canadians beating my top sales guys? Mm -hmm. Whenever you're given the opportunity to talk about yourself, there's a good way that you can boast and brag about yourself that gets people to want to work with you. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another Price to Sell podcast. And I'm on a different couch today. I'm still getting used to it. Doesn't have a name yet, but this is a different setup. Hope you guys like it. But I'm Matthew Campoli, as usual. That has not changed. Unless I get fired, I don't think I will. But on today's episode, we have a really special guest who I met not too long ago. Uh, a lot of similarities, a lot of synergies instantly, and, and those connections are always really cool to experience. But on the couch across from me today is a real estate tycoon that chose to quit the rat race to create internet, intergenerational wealth. With 15 years in the world of real estate investing, he has shared the stage with people like Grant Cardone. He has interviewed celebrities on the Toronto International Film Festival red carpet, and now serves as, uh, serves as a confidence and communication coach. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kyle Guthrow, thank you for coming. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Feels like we're uh, a wee distance away, but we'll, we'll make it work. How are well, you? Well, good. I'll wave, Feels like uh, I'll wave we're waving you. from different neighborhoods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the first, first time we're trying this out, it's yeah. like, a, you know, yeah. well, if, if you feel too far from me and you start to really like me, we'll start feel free to come on the sit couch? right here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're more than welcome. <laughs> but yeah, let's, um, that's my little intro, but I'd love for you to uh, give the audience a little uh, background into who you are. Absolutely. Uh, so like you mentioned, uh, my name is Kyle Guthrow. I've been in the real estate space since 2007. It's uh, hard to believe how fast time has gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done everything in the real estate industry except for land development, uh, buy and hold, fix and flip, multifamily, uh, construction side of it, raising capital, um, Airbnb, and uh, I've had a lot of fun with it. But uh, along the journey, uh, which I'm sure we'll dive into, I had a lot of ups, some downs. Uh, I was in the corporate world for 14 years before exiting that. And uh, been golfing for a very, very long time. Still yet to master it. 25 plus years, you'd think I'd be good at it, but uh, still not that great. Uh, huge traveler. Uh, been to close to 40 something countries. Mm. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, love snowboarding. So, okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So, do you, and this um, this real estate journey. So, since two thousand seven to now, it's quite a long time. Yes. Obviously, two thousand eight was a good time. You started at a pretty good time, I would yeah. say. Uh, probably a lot of lessons learned. Right in the heart of the credit crisis. Yeah, and so, I got into it by accident, really. So, what was your first investment? So, as soon as I got out of university, um, heart of the credit crisis, my dad came to me and said, "Hey, I want to diversify my portfolio," and I was like, "Okay, what's this got to do with me?" And he's like, I want to buy investment property. I'm like, no, no way am I becoming a landlord. I just saw what we did to that poor landlord's house at university, turned the walls into Swiss cheese, turned the carpets from white to black. I'm like, no, we destroyed that house. He's like, listen, it's not that bad. Let's just go buy something. So we were literally at the tail end of 2007. Um, as we know, in 2008, markets collapsed, Lehman Brothers with all that fun uh, we were literally going door knocking in Hamilton. It's where I was born and raised. Uh, and just were saying, hey, we'll give you a, a ridiculous number on houses that were for sale. A lot of doors kind of closed in our face. But eventually, a, an older lady said, yeah, I'm looking to sell, downsize, bought a small little uh, bungalow in Hamilton Mountain, uh, renovated it, and... Uh, Kind of, I told my dad that was the start of the beast. Nice. So, 
Yeah, lots of lessons learned on that very first property, mm -hmm. especially. You still have it? I ended up selling it. Okay. Um, I wish I didn't. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe like a big tip for those new investors or yeah. your audience is that real estate is a great game. Mm -hmm. And as you're aware, but the game is long term. If the longer you hold on to it, the more money you make. Mm -hmm. But we live in this instant gratification world where okay. everyone wants the Ferrari and Lamborghini tomorrow. Mm -hmm. While real estate is not a good avenue for that. Uh, even flipping can be very speculative. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I ended up selling that one in uh, 2014. Um, got into a bit of a tenant problem. And we thought the best way to get out of it was to sell the property. Uh, if you want to dive into that one, that one is, that was, there's a lot of lessons learned when dealing with difficult tenants trying to sell a property. Yeah. What, what was this instance? Well, I just, you, you witness it now, mm -hmm. uh, especially being in the market and seeing properties that are trying to get sold with tenants in it. And I was just trying to find a client, an investment property a couple of weeks ago. And I, I called the agent and I said, I'd like to show the property. She's like, can't show it. Well, what do you mean? It's tenanted, just being very difficult. So I'm like, go to my client. You do not inherit this problem. Yeah. Just walk away. Mm -hmm. And I kind of witnessed and went through that in my very first property. Uh, by then, I'd already accumulated a few properties. And I was like, this isn't fitting my portfolio anymore. Started focusing on brand new builds, brand new townhouses, and brand new subdivisions. In terms of what you're buying. Yeah. Not the building of them. No, not the building of them. Just, buying them. Yeah. Okay. Just following developers and buying off them. Yeah. And this one particular property was like 60 years old. Mm -hmm. We had renovated it. Tenants, every time I went in, it's like, what did they do to it? Yeah. Painted the walls like Barney purple. Uh, and uh, we just kind of had enough of them. And they, they paid their rent, but they were every week, it was something different. And it was our first property. So mm -hmm. we didn't know how to handle these situations. Every time they called, we went the next day and fixed it. And then it's like, okay, we want a new kitchen. So then eventually got to a point where they called the health department on us. So I got a phone call from the city of Hamilton health department. They're like, uh, you have mold problems, I was like, mold problems. First I'm hearing of it, met the inspector. He's like, there's no issues here. He gave me like small little things to fix. Mm -hmm. And of course the tenant was livid because I was like, there's nothing, no problems here. Yeah. And that was our first taste of like dealing with a difficult tenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the grand scheme of things, it really wasn't after looking back yeah. through the journey. Uh, we ended up trying to just offload it. Mm -hmm. And we figured the best way to evict them is to sell it. Yeah. They made the process very difficult. I'm a licensed agent. I didn't even want to sell it. Mm -hmm. And the agent we hired said, I can't do this. Yeah. Like your tenant's not allowing me in. We're giving them ample notice. We're giving them a fall in the rules. Mm -hmm. Just made it super difficult. And to kind of wrap the story up in a bow, we couldn't sell it because of the tenants. So we just kind of dealt with them, said, all right, every time they made in a request, no problem, we'll fix it. Again, we didn't become slumlords. And then eventually they came to us and said, we're going to buy a house. Hmm. I said, oh my God, thank you. Because <laughs> um, I'll never forget it real quick. An agent that had gone through the property, she's like, this is not showing well, offered us some ridiculous lowball price. I'm like, I'll hold on to it. Mm. She's like, you'll never sell it for north of this number. I said, okay, no problem. Tenants move out. As soon as they moved out, I knew we're getting well north of this number mm -hmm. because we went in, cleaned it up, yeah. uh, painted everything, the entire mm -hmm. unit. Like, it's amazing what paint can do. And uh, ended up selling it for a decent amount of money and turned around and bought two more properties from the proceeds of that. So I'm grateful that we went through it at such a early stage, but uh, parts of me do wish I had it because it did double in value when 2017 rolled around, mm -hmm. but I can't kick myself because I, like I said, I took those proceeds and bought two, scaled. two brand new yeah. townhouses with it. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was, um, some good lessons learned, for yeah. sure, for sure. Nice. So yeah. what's, uh, and what does your portfolio look like now? What's up guys, I'm gonna take a quick break here for one of our sponsors, Iron Shake. If you're looking for the best in the contracting space, whether you're just looking to renovate a small bathroom or build a house, Iron Shake has got your back. They have unlimited trades at your disposal. Reach out to them, they're the best in the business. 
quality service, integrity, and very good pricing is what they pride themselves on. Hit the links in the description, check out Iron Shake today and meet your contracting goals. Enjoy the rest of the show. Uh, predominantly all new builds. Okay. Um, when I say new, uh, I was buying in 2011, 12, 13, 14. Uh, basically, that again was by accident. Mm. Um, I was living in Hamilton. I wanted. I was commuting to downtown Toronto. I was like, oh, I'm going to go buy a brand new house. I was dating somebody at the time, and we had a falling out just as the house was about to be built. The, the builder kept delaying and delaying, running into issues. But back then, you only had to put $20,000 down. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, take as long as you guys want. I really don't care. Yeah. And then finally, when it came to the moving in, I had a falling out with my then girlfriend. And uh, I said, you know what? I don't want to live in Hamilton anymore. I'm mm -hmm. tired of this hour, 45 minute commute to downtown. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move downtown. Mm -hmm. And some people in Hamilton thought I was crazy because they all stick into their bubble. Yeah. And I'm sure you get it yeah, in I the, get that. the bourbon life. In Vaughn, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Big bad city, yeah. uh, but it was one of the best moves I ever did mm -hmm. because this brand new house I had lived in for one month, two months. I was like, I can't do this. I'm not doing this commute anymore. Ended up getting a place in downtown Toronto. And I was like, I'll rent it out. So I threw it up on Kijiji before Facebook Marketplace and all those days. And I got it rented out in a week. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what the hell? And they were paying $1,600 back in 2011, which I thought was a crazy amount. More which, than enough. Which property is this? This was a townhouse. Okay, a three okay. bedroom, three bathroom, yeah. brand new townhouse mm -hmm. in Hamilton. But it was more than enough to cover all the expenses and a little bit of cash flow. But I wasn't really concerned about the cash flow. I just wanted to move to Toronto. Mm -hmm. So even if I broke even or had a little bit of a loss, I didn't care. As soon as I found out I was making some decent money, I went back to the developer, I said, you got any more of these? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, I got another phase coming. It's like, let me know. So lo and behold, I went into their showroom or their model home, walked in, and he's like, yeah, but all these are available. I'm like, you know, the new development? I'm mm -hmm. like, put a sticker on these two. Yeah. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'll take both. Yeah. He's like, okay. I told my brothers about it. Mm -hmm. I have uh, twin brothers that are a year younger than me. They went in, developer, same spot, bought two more. Yeah. So in like a matter of a day, uh, my brothers and I bought four houses on the same street. Mm -hmm. And then we always joked with uh, the developer. I'm like, can we change the street name to yeah. Guthrow? Yeah, that's funny. He's like, ah. Um, but that was kind of the journey of following the developers. Mm -hmm. Because back then, it was unbelievable. You only had to put twenty, twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 for down payments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these things weren't getting built for a year. Yeah. Now... For me, I didn't care how long they took mm -hmm. because, like as you know, time appreciates everything yeah. for the most part. Mm -hmm. And buying in 2011 and 12 and 13, by the time the house was built, the develop the property had gone up almost a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And what it was great back then was that mortgages were super easy to get. Mm -hmm. The banks were literally handing out cash. Yeah. And I'd be like, "Can I pull equity out of this one?" and buy this like absolutely mm -hmm. so then we i was learning tax strategies the accountants were saying okay do this move money around that way mm -hmm. and there was a point where i think i bought my fourth or fifth development um townhouse off the developers and they cut one of them just stopped and said how are you doing this like oh i'm just moving money around and mm -hmm. he's like no but how are you getting approved mm -hmm. for all these so i started getting into joint ventures got into a joint venture a couple properties with my dad so you're not using your name for everything uh, so lesson learned, uh -huh. all these were in my personal name okay. and still are. Okay. Uh, how would you do it differently? I would definitely set them up as corporations now, okay. but when it comes to mortgages, obviously as you're aware, the corporation now has to be approved for the mortgage Yeah. and it sometimes gets tricky if you're a new corp and you have no money, mm -hmm. the bank's going to be like, okay, show me how you're funding this. So. What I tell people is when you're getting your first or your second, okay, put in maybe your personal name. Again, I'm not an accountant, not a lawyer or a mortgage broker, so this is just my opinion. Um, if you're going for that first one, maybe put in your personal name, build up the rapport and the credit. And I will tell people getting with good mortgage people, mortgage brokers, 
literally these people play chess. Mm -hmm. They're always thinking next move. And I had a phenomenal mortgage person that was always thinking three steps ahead. Okay, what about if you buy a next property? I'm like, let's focus on this one. No, no, no. This is important because if we don't focus on your next one, you could, this property could screw that mortgage deal. So we were always kind of moving money around and there was no stress test back then. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you're approved. I had a great job. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the bank, from the corporate perspective, I had a very steady occupation. Uh, I think it'd be a little bit trickier now, mm -hmm. but uh, as an entrepreneur, but I capitalized on it. Yeah. Um, people kept saying, why do you want to be a landlord? Um, why are you renovating? Why are you working on these properties? Like, yeah, it's a grind sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking back, I will say real estate has generated the most amount of wealth in yeah. my, my life. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like it has for many. Very powerful tool. And let's fast forward to today now. So obviously dealing with the economy and all these obstacles and hurdles we have to jump through. What kind of investing are you doing now? Uh, so I just sold a sixplex mm -hmm. at the height of the market. Nice. Uh, Where was that? Hamilton. Okay. Uh, again, by accident. Okay. So I was uh, working with a business partner and we were flipping homes. Mm -hmm. We ended up just getting bigger and bigger, ended up buying a burnt, like completely burnt sixplex. Went in, structural damage everywhere. Fire had started in the basement. So we had to really- How was the financing on that? We had to get all private lending. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's where I came into using my connections, yeah. went to my connections of lawyers. Uh -huh. Guys, I need to raise money. Uh, ended up raising seven figures for mm -hmm. the deal. And again, that taught me a lot of lessons. Sorry, are you- um this raising of capital, these people that are investing the money, obviously they have skin in the game with no, the deal No, these ones were just investors. So just just on interest? They, interest, okay. yeah. I did not want to give up equity. Did, um, you, did you put your own money down or is this like a strategy where you we, actually we, used... From the proceeds from some of the flips, mm -hmm. we put that money for down payments mm -hmm. just to show that we had skin in the game. Yeah. Uh, what attracted a lot of our investors mm -hmm. was obviously the property itself. And when you demolish a property, mm -hmm. you're actually devaluing it. So from the day we bought it to a month later, we actually probably lost $100,000 in equity because we were ripping out furnaces, ripping mm -hmm. out all the fixtures. So we actually devalued it. But what made it a really attractive to a lot of the investors was that I had my portfolio. So I was giving personal guarantees. Mm -hmm. And looking back, uh, I was doing what I had to do to get this sixplex going. But looking back, thankfully everything worked out. I did put a lot of liability on me personally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I exposed my portfolio. Yeah. And that always kind of bothered me mm -hmm. uh, that I put up the risk, whereas my business partner didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think even just, and I love this guy, uh, did a lot of work with him, childhood friend. But I will say you got to make sure that you're protecting yourself. Okay. From a liabilities perspective, from a finance perspective. I've seen people lose a lot of money on flips. Um, people blow their budgets out of the water. Uh, but you learn a lot. Like, I had a lot of fun flipping. I really, really enjoyed the construction world of it. Mm -hmm. um, it happened during COVID. Man, try and imagine renovating and flipping properties yeah. with Home Depot closed. Like, yeah. I can, you can work around trades not being able to work. Yeah. You can always find somebody. But if your main material person, Home Depot, is closed and you literally need to just get a box of screws, mm -hmm. and that was back in the height of the pandemic where you had to order everything a day in advance. Yeah. Now I got six carpenters mm -hmm. sitting around because they don't have something as simple as screws. Yeah. Um, but it also taught me a lot that, you know what? We couldn't get the trades. They didn't mm -hmm. want to work. So who ended up doing the work? my business partner and I, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting in my head going, I left the corporate world, sitting in a nice cozy office to stomping in a dumpster, swinging a hammer and carrying drywall. I'm like, how the hell did this happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But super grateful uh -huh. for everything, all those skills that I was able to learn. Yeah. And also had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Like there's days where you kind of laugh it off, 
it's like there's no way something else could go bad. Yeah. Sure enough, something bad. Open up a wall. It's like, of course, you yeah, just classic. you gotta gotta laugh at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm grateful for that journey. Yeah, it taught me a lot. And um, so to kind of come back to the question, it's that the market's tricky, and my next move is probably not investing in Canada. Okay. It probably will be in the states, mm -hmm. um, as you and I have had conversations over coffee about Florida. Um, working with Grant, mm -hmm. I got to spend a lot of time in South Florida, yeah. in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, fell in love with South Florida, which I didn't think I would. Mm -hmm. uh, but during the pandemic, it was the only place that was open. Yeah. So it, you learned a lot about even just the American culture as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up back selling that sixplex because the money partner stopped paying our trades. Okay. We found out afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I had a huge falling out mm -hmm. with one of the money partners and our only option was to sell. And I was pissed. Mm -hmm. We were 60% done mm -hmm. the renovations, sold at the height of the market, got a pretty good number mm -hmm. only to find out like two years later that a realtor sent me, he's like, wasn't this your property? They had sold it for less than what they bought it off us for. Wow and they finished the renovation. Oh, wow. Yeah, see? So they lost probably so you know a couple hundred thousand yeah. dollars. And I looked at that going, wow, Good dodged timing. a bullet. Yeah. Um, so Even sometimes you when done? you're pissed off or you're yeah. angry at the situation, it's not until you look forward like two or three years later, you're like, wow, that actually was a blessing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, well, yeah, that's cool. A lot <laughs> of things happen like that. Because even though it was, you weren't done, but it was high to the market, so you, you won there. and Yeah. If you had continued and probably gone through more stress and all that, you yeah. would have lost, which is funny to look back on. But um, what are some, so you worked at Grand Cardone. Yes. Which is cool. Yeah. Um, what's one, drop one thing, one nugget you learned from being in proximity with Grant. Good question. Um, Grant is who he is in person as he is on social media. Mm -hmm. Um he tells it raw, which I resonated with. I tell a lot of people, you either love him or hate him. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't like the flashiness, him showing off the jet and all his money. To me, I'm never envious of that stuff. I actually uh, am super motivated towards people that are showing off their jet or cars or whatever the hell it may be. Mm -hmm. If it's done in a tasteful and kind of good manner, but uh, one nugget that I will learn from Grant is just his, his work ethic. I'll never forget it. We were, so my, um, I got introduced to Grant because of a person named Richard Dolan, a uh, powerhouse in the industry. And I actually met him through back in the day in the real estate investment network and ended up becoming business partners with them. He ended up working with a lot of celebrities and then kind of pitched to Grant, hey, you should license out, license out your brand and your name. So that's how we got in the door with Grant. Like if you look at grantcardone.com slash licensing, that was a program that myself and a couple others developed and then ended up selling for Grant. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. We were doing really well. Um, then this was before the pandemic. We had got the great opportunity to go down to GrowthCon, which was in Las Vegas in 2019 and uh we sold a lot of his license program that mm. weekend so much so that we got a lot of recognition saying at the the one morning meeting huddle grant had mentioned how the hell are these canadians beating my top sales guys mm -hmm. so it was kind of a little feather in the cap for us and we we're like yeah. yeah but we learned so much mm -hmm. uh i learned a ton from the sales world mm -hmm. And this is coming from a person that was in real estate and sales, but to see the American way, especially even like the Floridian or South Florida way, going to Grant's head office was pretty cool. A uh, little bit of like the movie with Jordan Belfort. Um, Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. A lot of male energy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, screaming, shouting, closing sales, clapping. Mm -hmm. But it was really cool because it showed us a side of sales 
that, you know what, as Canadians, I find sometimes find we're not aggressive enough. Mm -hmm. Was it a little too much over the top? Maybe. But that was their way of selling. Yeah. And I'll never forget when we were at GrowthCon and we were selling, we did well because we inherited a lot of their tips, their tricks, their traits. And uh, I ended up carrying that back to me in my Canadian ways. I find sometimes, and I, I say this a lot with my clients, is that, and I know I'm broad brushing, um, so don't attack me on social media. But as Canadians, I find we're sometimes a little chicken and we're cheap. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? We're chicken with what we give out in terms of our content and we're cheap with what we actually have accomplished. So a lot of the times as a communications coach, I work with businesses and brands and I'm like, okay, tell me what you do. They're like, I'm a real estate agent. I'm like, really? There's like 70,000 real estate agents mm -hmm. in Ontario. You're a more than just a real estate agent. Whereas to answer your question, one tidbit I did learn from Grant was whenever you're given the opportunity to talk about yourself, there's a good way that you can boast and brag about yourself that gets people to want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think he's exploded in the real estate space and able to generate such a, a huge real estate fund in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like a guy's got like five billion dollars worth of real estate. Yeah, and he had next to none ten years ago. Yeah, so it just shows you how crazy real estate can really go. Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to put in the work for sure. Yeah, um, it was an absolute pleasure working with Grant, sharing the stage with him. Uh, learned a lot from yeah. him, and uh, I'm grateful that we we got to do it. And I'm I'm grateful for my business partners that we we took that chance for sure. So, and his focus is multifamily? His focus is just huge real estate developments. Just like, like apartments? Massive and... apartments. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, like if you Google them, some of these things are like $200 million. Yeah, that's like cool. They're, we're not talking like little 60 unit, 80 unit. We're talking like 1,000 unit. I think he's got 13,000 units now or yeah. something crazy wow. like that. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah. So. And then let's jump into now. So you teach, um, you're a coach for communication skills yep. and confidence specifically. Yes. So communication how, how did, side. How does that work? So uh, it does dabble a little bit into the sales world. Um, I do have a lot of cross collaboration. Obviously, real estate is one of my massive passions. Uh, I've been in this industry of a very, very long time. And to say that it doesn't get roped in, a lot of people will always ask, oh, so what do you do? It's like, well, what day and what time is it? Because again, being a real estate agent, real estate investor, um, obviously working with Grant, but I find there was a lot of breakdowns and it happened from communication. I would meet a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people at networking events where I knew they had a great product or a great service, but they couldn't articulate their message. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to share exactly who they were. And what kind of happened and transpired was I was always good in the public speaking space. Uh, part of Toastmasters, I had competed in Toastmasters. Um, for those that don't know, Toastmasters is a public speaking community. And one contest in particular was, it's called Table Topics. And the way Table Topics works in the Toastmasters community is you have three to four minutes to speak on a subject that you have no idea what it is until you are about to be introduced. So they go, Kyle Guthrow, your topic is molecular biology, Kyle Guthrow. And in 10 seconds, you have to start speaking. So imagine thinking of a topic, thinking of a storyline in a full three minute speech mm -hmm. right on the fly. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, it scared the living crap out of people, but yeah. for me, I thrived in it. Yeah, I yeah, loved yeah. it. That's cool. Uh, so they had annual competitions mm -hmm. and ended up going seven layers deep, mm -hmm. made it to the provincials of this, beat out 4,000 plus people, and ended up placing third in the entire province cool. in that contest. So I say that not to impress, but rather impress upon that Communication is vitally important to mm -hmm. business, yeah. to relationships, to raising kids. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just witnessing so many individuals that had great products, great services, and go up on stage 
and you just get blank stares. Yeah. And I knew it was because of their delivery. I knew it wasn't because of their product or service, but rather that they were speaking to the wrong audience. Like you had tech people that would start talking about the algorithm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is a room full of angel investors. Talk about how we're making them money. Yeah. So that's how I kind of fell into that world. And I was doing a lot of speaking at my old corporation. I was a project manager, always was speaking in front of uh, my team, in front of the C-suites, in front of the president, executives. Uh, so I got very comfortable speaking in front of people. And I just knew that I wanted to help a lot of people in that space on how to become better communicators. Yeah. Uh, so you, and you do that now? I do that now. Uh, obviously, I've got the real estate investing, um, helping some clients in that space. I uh, do love, though, I love public speaking. So how can, what are some, so how can people, like, in, as an entrepreneur, obviously, communication is very important. What's some, like, ta like, tactical advice you would give to someone you're coaching if they, let's say, they're scared or not confident to come out there and communicate properly? They're losing the battle because of the communication. Yeah. Like, I know agents who suffer because um, they just have no confidence and the, the delivery, people look at them like, okay, like, thanks, you know, versus yeah. like, oh, I want more of this guy yeah. or girl. Um, that's a great question. And it's a loaded one. Uh, I would think for a lot of people, make it about your client. So if we were to use real estate agents as an example, even mortgage brokers, anybody in the real estate profession, I often would say, make it about your clients. If you're on stage, make it about your audience. The reason why people fear public speaking, the number one fear in the world behind death, is that people make it too much about them. So they get up on stage, they get super nervous, they think everyone's looking at them or judging them, and I often stop them and say, if you make it about your audience and not about you, the nerves will subside and you will be able to deliver an unbelievable topic or speech. <clears throat> the reason why, because you made it about your audience. Mm -hmm. Why do we go on social media? Why do we go to these events? Why do we hang out and network? Because we want to learn something. Mm -hmm. But when you're a speaker or communicator, we get raptured in our own head and saying, oh, it's about me. And I said, no, make it about your audience. And the reason why people are so fearful of it is because they're scared of judgment, which ultimately stems from ego. So if I have to tell people as a speaker, Put your ego aside. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit if, oh, I shouldn't apologize. Uh, sorry, apologize you for swearing. Shit. Uh, okay. Um, shit. I, I don't care if you've spoken in front of 10,000 people or 100 or two people. Deliver great information to your audience mm. and you will leave better than they um, showed up. Mm -hmm. And for your audience, they're going to really resonate because they picked up some nuggets. They picked up something from you. So for you, you're a real estate agent. Can I put you on the spot? Yeah, I love being on the spot. Okay. 60 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do. If we were to meet for the very first time, how would you introduce yourself? 60 seconds or less? Yeah. Matthew Campoli, I'll help you fulfill your real estate dreams. Is that it? In the, in the best so, and most fun way possible because you're going to love me. Okay. Because I love me. Okay. So. I'll just say something. I, I'm just, I just get weird and quirky, man. I'll just say something really That's ridiculous. cool. Yeah. Now, imagine mm -hmm. I'm Kevin O'Leary and I'm going to invest $100 million. Would you say the same thing? No. I come with a, a full-blown okay. pitch. Pitch I'm Kevin O'Leary. Now what are you saying? I mean, it's hard as a real estate agent. I'm just a realtor. You're just a realtor? No, I'm not. Okay. Mm. So 60, 30 seconds or less, what would you say if I was Kevin O'Leary? Kevin, you may not know me yet, but you will. Okay. If I told you that I'm going to find you the perfect house of your dreams, and as soon as you step inside this house, you're going to regrow all your hair, <laughs> would you do it? Okay. You would say yes. Yes. Okay. Mm. All right, so as a communication expert, did you make it about Kevin or about you? That was about Kevin. Was it though? Yeah, it was all about his hair. Okay, fair enough. And his dream home. True. Combined. 
But do you know he's in the market for a dream home? That's no. So this is where I help a lot of clients mm -hmm. and a big takeaway for your audience. So I coined it and call it question through conversation. You learn this. How do you know what your clients want? Mm -hmm. You have to ask them. Yeah, for sure. So, but you don't just ask them. So are you in the market to buy? Like mm -hmm. if you were to walk into Audi or Mercedes or BMW, what brought you into the dealership today? Mm -hmm. I hate that question. Yeah. Um, welcome to Mercedes. My name is so-and-so. Um, I'm curious, what's your name? Mm -hmm. Always ask the person's name. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, if you're introducing yourself, always say your full name. Yeah. The reason why, people need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you're speaking in front of somebody, you got to have your story ready. What is your pitch? So whether you're in real estate or you're in the tech sector or you're in the gym space, that gets skipped a lot. And not to bring it back to Grant, but I think this story is very important because the very first time I met Grant, I already had a story in my head. I'll, re I'll tell it really quickly. I was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. That's uh, cool. Yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. And uh, with Kilimanjaro, you do not have self-service. You do not, you basically, no running water. Um, you're camping. There's, it's pretty rough. Mm -hmm. But as you go higher in the elevation, your phone's dead. Like, mm -hmm. there's no service whatsoever. So I was listening to a lot of audiobooks. Yeah. And the one I was listening to in particular was called 10X Rule, which was Grant's. Yeah. I had never met Grant. Mm -hmm. And I remember kept hearing, as I was climbing the mountain for 9 to 12 hours a day, sometimes even, like, longer. How many days was this total? Seven. Wow, okay. Yeah, That's it's cool. uh, it's quite the hike. Uh, I yeah. highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget it. He talked about a chapter... And I think it was chapter five. It says, don't be a little bitch. Mm -hmm. And as I'm climbing this mountain, I'm getting exhausted, physically tired. The rain was re relentless, the cold. And all I kept hearing was, don't be a little bitch. Don't be a little bitch. And uh, I said, if I ever meet Grant, I'm telling him this story. Mm -hmm. So the very first time he came to Toronto to speak at a real estate event, again, Richard Dolan uh, introduced me backstage to Grant. I said, Grant, it's just me and Grant. Elena and his two daughters. Okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. I said, Grant, can I share a quick story with you? He's like, absolutely. So I shared this Kilimanjaro story with him. He's like, oh man, that's so cool. I'm like, that's awesome. Uh, and then just had a nice conversation with Elena and the, his kids. So he goes up on stage in front of, I think it was three or 4,000 people. And I'm back in the back of the room. He's like, I met someone interesting backstage. He's like, where's Kyle? I was like, oh shit. He's like, come up here. <laughs> I'm like, you instantly came back to my head. Table topics, mm -hmm. Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I don't know what I'm going to speak about. Yeah. So as I'm walking through the conference center to the front, so like, come here, come here. Tell the audience what you told me backstage. I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. So I shared my whole story yeah. about the 10X rule and then Grant segued it. And it was just really cool to be on stage with Grant People paid thousands of dollars, and you know this from the event space, to uh, be on that stage. And I got to be up there for free. Yeah. Uh, so I often tell this. The reason why I share this story is I tell people, be prepared. What is the pitch that you want to tell someone? What is the pitch that if you met someone for the very first time, what is one minute or less that you would like to share about yourself? Mm -hmm. But make it about them. See how I made it about Grant? Yep. Grant, your 10X rule book inspired me to get yeah. up the mountain. Mm -hmm. But I also shared my story. Yeah. So when you're in this communication world, in this real estate world, in the sales world, you're always selling. But I will often tell people, make it about your clients. So what if, like you just said, you know, uh, the 60 second thing, like, tell me about yourself. Let's say you're meeting someone who you don't know about. I don't have the luxury of like looking them up on Google yeah. or knowing that they have a book or listening to their book. They're just the average client that I'm trying to get. And instead of me saying, whatever, okay. um, how would you then do it? So if you had 60 seconds, uh, I often love to ask, so what industry are you in? Mm -hmm. I need to figure that out first. So you ask, them, ask them a lot of questions to I learn do, and I, then pitch, essentially? See, you do want to leave them with a bit of a hook. 
Yep. Because then that asks subsequent questions or it leaves them saying, hey, I want to find out more. Yeah. But if you're, uh, you come out of the gate mm -hmm. with what I call features, advantages, and benefits, you overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, whoa, whoa, I don't need all these. So imagine you walked into Mercedes and, and you said, um, they started showing you everything there is to know about the Sprinter van. Mm -hmm. You're like, I don't need a Sprinter van. I need the G-Wagon. Mm -hmm. But if they start showing you all the features, advantages, and benefits of a Sprinter, you'd be like, why are you wasting my time? Yeah. So you do need to do a little bit of question. So often at a networking event, hey, so what industry are you in? I'm in real estate. Oh, what part of real estate? Oh, I'm a mortgage broker. Oh, how long have you been in that industry for? Five years. Interesting. Which uh, brokerage do you work with? Oh, I run my own. Interesting. This is the next question I love asking. Mm -hmm. What's your biggest pain point that you're currently experiencing in your business? Okay, so that because now, a lot. yeah, yeah, they are going to divulge something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because what, as in sales, you want to figure out what their problem is, mm -hmm. and I'm going to solve it. Hopefully, that, that that can universally work with everything. And not only that, yeah, if you can find out a bit of information, so if, go back to the car example. I'm curious, what car do you currently drive? Mm -hmm. That says a lot about you. Yes. Because if they're driving uh, an M3 and they're in Mercedes, well, I know that I could probably maybe sell them an S-Class. Or if they're currently buying, uh, if they currently are driving an Audi, uh, I'm not really familiar with Audi, but um, I don't know, Q3. You know, you're going to try and sell them the Mercedes uh, GLC 300. So you, knowing that information can go definitely a long way. But... Often in the sales world, I find too many salespeople talk too much. Yes. Oh, I can agree. They need to ask can, more questions. I can agree fully on that. Like I'm they'll come out of the gate. I'll never forget yeah. it. I was at a networking event and I just met this person, literally shook her hand and she started going on about this new development. And I had to pause her. I said, hold on. Do you even know if I'm in this industry? Well, no. So you're going to waste both of our time explaining about a development that I'm probably not interested in. Well, I caught her and I said, do you want some advice? Unsolicited I said, have you ever invested in multifamily? How's your investment portfolio doing? Now you have to build rapport before you ask very personal questions. Mm -hmm. So you don't come out of the gate and say, um, Matthew, how much money in, do you have to spend in investments? That's way too personal of a question for me to ask you right out of the gate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But sometimes in sales, that works. Yeah. Like, I've often seen a lot of salespeople go through a 30-minute pitch, and they're not even speaking to the right person. Yeah. They're not speaking to the decision maker. Yeah. Or you get the, I'm not in the market to buy right now. Mm -hmm. Just wasted a lot of time because you didn't fact find and yeah. do questions through conversation. I like the pain point question. Yeah. I think I can apply that with, we're doing a lot of open houses right now. We're crushing a lot of open houses yeah. and converting through them. Um, that question will work perfectly. Yeah. Because they're in the open house for a reason. Yeah, exactly. They're like either the nosy point. Nancy's mm -hmm. or they're, they want to get out of their current home. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. I really like that. Okay. Well, as we, um, Come to an end here. I have a couple of questions. Yes. Think of these as like quick, fun, answer them, we'll answer them quickly, and but there's gonna be some tactical questions here. So love it. Um to real estate, what's your favorite type of real estate investing? Oof. I've always loved flipping. Okay. I love seeing properties come from the absolute worst and turning them to absolutely something stunning. And not just that, seeing what it does to the neighborhood. Okay. One in particular we did, it was in a really rough area of Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And it was disgusting. Like I'm talking the worst of the worst. Walked in, family of cockroaches living under the fridge. Had to evict them. Uh, they didn't want to leave quietly. And we turned that property into an absolute gem. One that I was super proud of. But not only that, to see the neighbors come in afterwards and one neighbor said, you don't understand what this is going to do for our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Because it literally is going to now 
raised the entire bar of that entire street. Mm -hmm. And she, I probably just made her a hundred thousand dollars in her property alone. Yeah. And then what happened? People see that we were successful. What do other flippers do? Mm. They try to find other properties on that exactly. street. Now you're same. building the whole neighborhood up. Yeah. And I think that's why, but if you communicate that with the neighbors, mm -hmm. it goes a long way because sure. you're destroying, you got bins out front of their house. It's mm -hmm. noisy. It's like, but you just remind them, Hey, we're really transforming your neighborhood. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then from a, just like a number standpoint, um, what kind of investment have you seen perform the best for you? Oof, buy and hold. Buy and hold. Okay. Yeah. Um, so buy, I still, rent, hold. Buy, rent, and then hold. Okay. Um, and I just tell people it's not so much focusing on when to buy, mm -hmm. but when to sell. Yeah. And everyone's caught up now in interest rates and, mm -hmm. oh, this isn't a good time to buy. And I often just ask them, are you planning on selling in the next five years? Yeah. No. Then what does it matter? Then buy. Exactly. Honestly, mm -hmm. a 1% dip here or there mm -hmm. in either direction isn't going to really change the real estate portfolio. Yeah. Your biggest failure and how you overcame it? Oof, that's a good question. Uh, biggest failure would be a personal one. Um, oof, that's a good question. Biggest failure. Uh, I would say there's two pain points that kind of occurred. Um, I went through a divorce and that was a tough um, turning point. And it was in the heart of the pandemic. Uh, and as guys, we're always taught, suck it up, don't show your emotions, deal with it. And while I was going through that, I was also renovating, flipping, my businesses were, were, felt like they were collapsing in on themselves. There was times where we didn't know if we were even gonna make money on these flips. So you compound that with business being a problem with the pandemic, which I'm sure a lot of people went through. And then I've got this divorce. I'm moving out of my house, um, dealing with that. I'm, oh man, you're gonna put me down there. Uh, and when I was flipping, I'll never forget it, that I didn't really have a place to go. Mm -hmm. And there would be times where I, where I felt safe was in these flipped properties. Mm -hmm. And as we were renovating them, my business partner who was married and had a child, he'd go home. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm just going to keep working for a bit. Yeah. And I don't even think he knows this, but I would, I brought a sleeping bag Yeah. and I would sleep in my truck. Uh-huh. I would literally work till midnight because I wanted to just keep my mind busy and I would sleep in my truck and I'd wake up and he'd be like, Oh, you're here early. And he didn't know that I would literally go to good life, work out, shower, and then go back at it again. Mm -hmm. And I would sometimes even sleep in the construction properties. Mm -hmm. I would, Oh man, I'm even embarrassed to admit this, but Obviously, when you're in construction, a lot of the times, first thing that goes in is a tub, but they usually come in giant boxes. And I'll never forget that I, uh, I was just so exhausted mentally and physically from flips, from construction, from clients, from my marriage breakdown. I remember just sleeping on a box mm -hmm. going, Kyle, what the fuck did you do to your life? You had a corporate job, literally the golden handcuffs what the hell are you doing? And that was a pretty low point. But I just kept saying, you know what? One day I'm going to look back and talk about this. And it was my ego. Mm -hmm. My ego chewed at me saying, dude, why are you jumping up in a dumpster trying to squish down garbage? And my ego was screaming at me, get out of this. Go back to the corporate world. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have a choice. I'd quit. Uh, that was definitely one of the lows, but one thing that was a saving grace with that was, uh, I found my new love for the gym, fitness and nutrition. I witnessed some of my friends go through similar things and kind of resorted down a path. I didn't want to gambling, drinking drugs, 
And I found um, solace in the gym. And I just said in, in 2021, enough with the excuses. I was eating terribly, as you know, when you're on the road. Uh, McDonald's was my staple and Tim Hortons and bagels. Mm. And I just said enough's enough and uh, dedicated my life to health and fitness. So that, that was your turnaround. That was what got me through it. Nice. It's just, I was like, I'm done with the excuses. I'm done mm. feeling bad for myself. Yeah. And I set a stupid New Year's resolution goal. And, at, uh, and I'm not a New Year's guy, New Year's resolution guy. But I'll never forget it. Uh, I was doing a cold plunge up at my cottage in Muskoka. And uh, I sat in there. I said, you know what? I'm going to work out every day mm -hmm. in 2021. No excuse. And I didn't tell anybody. Didn't post it on social media. And uh, it wasn't until I hit the year mark that I finally told everybody. And they're like, what? Mm -hmm. And little did I know that I had started inspiring a lot of other people to cool. get on their fitness journey. So I've learned that speak through vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Speak about things. Yeah, because it's important. Because it will definitely help other people that are going through uh, mm -hmm. similar problems like that. And a little humble brag, uh, I have not broke that streak since 2021. Oh, boy. It's been 1,160 something days. Cool. So I'm grateful that mm -hmm. I went through that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You always look back. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That was yeah. definitely one of the lows. I can vouch for the gym as a, <laughs> as a saving grace for sure. Yeah. Um, quick answer. Favorite place to buy real estate? Favorite place to buy real estate? Still, I'm a sucker for Hamilton. Okay. In the Hamilton area. Just born and raised there. Yeah. My, Toronto's home. I've lived here for 14 years, but just to go back and see, visit my brothers and my parents, just to see the transformation. Yeah. It, it's cool because Hamilton was always looked over. We but were that steel num town, blue collar. Numbers wise, it's good. I still think it's still a great place to invest. Okay. You got to, but I, in real estate in general, you got to do your work though. Yeah, like, for sure. Those days of, I'm just going to buy it and then it's going to go up 3% mm -hmm. a month. They're, those days are gone. Yeah. Uh, but I will say Hamilton still got a lot of room to grow in there. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And then last question, coolest person you met on the red carpet at TIFF? Ooh, Kate Beckinsale. I know the name. I just yeah. Kate face. Beckinsale. She was a uh, big, she was in serendipity. She was, a, she was it, in, uh, underworld. It. Still got to Google. Yeah. It. yeah. You got to Google her. Um, English girl. She's, uh, I had a, a crush on her. Google it while I talk about it. I had a crush on her when I was in high school. Uh, she was in, I think it was called Underworld or, and. Uh, okay. Yeah. That looks familiar. <laughs> Cause you're in her roles. Yeah. Um, she was cool. Mm. Um, Jessica Chastain, Eddie Redman, when we were doing the, the good news, good nurse. That was really cool to see. Um, to be honest, even just some of the conversations I had with the people that you didn't know, mm -hmm. interviewing directors and writers, mm -hmm. they're very passionate towards film. Yeah. And I think I really connected well with them mm -hmm. because I love people that are just super passionate towards whatever industry they're in. Yeah. Uh, I'm very passionate towards real estate and speaking. Mm -hmm. And for some people, they're very passionate about uh, art. And I think we're missing a lot of that in today's world. Everyone keeps yeah. jumping ship. It's like, Where's the hot new topics? Like, oh, it's Forex, Bitcoin. It's like, mm. no, if you're passionate towards it, just go all in on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Agreed. So, Okay, amazing, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate if, it. If uh, anyone wants to reach out, maybe to uh, the, 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 the communication stuff is really cool. Yeah. Um, anyone wants to reach out and learn more, where can they find you? Uh, very active on social media. Mm. Um, my handles are all the same across all of them. It's at Kyle Guthrow, K-Y-L-E. G U T H R O, uh, hit me up, Instagram, um, kyleguthrow.com. And, uh, yeah, but I'm pretty active on social media. So, uh, love what you guys are up to. I think the skits you guys are doing are pretty hilarious. Thank and, you. uh, if people want some fun or want to witness me in pain, go on my Instagram. I've got some cool, uh, ice plunging videos that have gone pretty viral. So, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So. Well, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed. You know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, share, like, subscribe, comment, and share again. Maybe do it three times. Uh, if you feel like downloading a separate account so you can comment more, that'd be great. And subscribe. I'm kidding. But you know what to do. We'll see you guys on the next one.